Are you in dental school wondering when the hell is this all gonna be over? I bet you wanna be on the other side already enjoying your fun-filled doctor life. And I totally get you. Starting a career as a dental professional is an exciting time for new graduates. But right when you graduate, you're gonna to have to find the right job so you can thrive both in your private and professional life. And you're gonna be handed a contract, which more than likely, nobody has taught you how to properly read and interpret. You see, there's an old saying in dentistry. It goes something like, old dentists eat their young. That means there's a ton of people in both private practice and corporate dentistry offering dental contracts to kids right out of school who have no idea what they're reading, so they blindly just sign on the paper, not realizing that it's a really terrible deal for them. And by the time they realize it, and they're already on their way out of the door, while a new unexpected graduate bites on the next hook being casted. Let's put an end to that vicious cycle today. Today, I'll be going over some of the most important factors in a dental contract to look out for. There may be some terms you're unfamiliar with, so we'll cover those in detail too. And if I miss anything, please drop it in the comments below. And stay till the end of the video where I talk about my own first dental contract, which was completely different from any other contract I've ever seen before. Without further ado, let's get right into what they don't want you to know about your next dental contract. The first consideration we have to talk about is compensation structure. We all want to get paid, right? A common payment method in dentistry is a daily guarantee as a base salary. For instance, an associate might earn $120,000 annually by working Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The advantage of this setup is stability. Even if there are cancellations, the associate still receives their pay. For some time now, the standard base pay in dentistry has been around $600 USD per day. However, there's a downside to a fixed compensation. But please, if you are looking for jobs just starting out, Find one with a daily guarantee. If an office can offer you a daily rate, that almost guarantees that you will be busy enough to produce a lot of dentistry, which hopefully is what you want. I've been in jobs without a daily, and many times I was just sitting around and waiting. No patients would even show up, or if I had a low case acceptance day, I would make close to nothing because I didn't have a daily guarantee to protect my earnings. You definitely want a daily, but you shouldn't rely on the daily as your highest potential salary. The downsides are that if they're only offering a daily with no additional benefits, the office might take advantage of the dentist and schedule more appointments than the associate can handle, resulting in an overworked employee. To prevent associates from feeling unmotivated and encourage higher production, it's really important to understand the difference between the percentage of production and the percentage of collection in this compensation package. While both approaches have their merits, a flat percentage of production is often more favorable as it aligns with your compensation with actual revenue generated by the practice. However, it is common for new graduates to receive around 28 to 35% of collections, but this may vary. Paid off production means any procedures you do in the office, you get paid Paid for, regardless of what amount of money is collected at the end. However, getting paid off collection is much more risky. This means that if you do a crown for a bill of $1,000 and the patient never ends up paying, you get zero or if the insurance states that the fee is downgraded to $750. You're not getting a percentage off the original thousand. Or even if your front desk isn't skilled enough at insurance coding, maybe they didn't understand what a missing tooth clause was and they forgot to code it properly. And now insurance doesn't cover the crown or bridge at all. The patient isn't gonna pay that portion. So somebody loses out on that money and that's you. Dentistry is really one of the only jobs you may not get paid for work that you literally did. So be very careful about how your contract states that you get paid. You can make both work if you have a healthy stream of patients ready to work on and there's no shortage of work to be done. If you notice the clinic is quiet or very slow, you have been warned. It may not be the best opportunity for you. Now, production refers to the total dollar value of dental care provided to a patient during their visit. For instance, if a patient agrees to get a crown that their insurance will reimburse for $800, the dentist has produced $800 for that crown. However, it can take a month or even two for the insurance company to send payment to the dental office for that crown. This means that the office doesn't actually receive the money until much later than the bi-weekly pay cycle for the dentist. So even though the dentist produced $800 for the crown during that pay period, the office hasn't collected any money yet. 
Some offices compensate their dentists with a base salary plus a percentage of the collections received. Next, evaluate the percentage of the lab bill you are responsible for, as it can significantly impact your overall profitability, especially if you perform lab-intensive procedures. Negotiating a reduction in your share of the lab bill can be helpful and many are willing to budge here. If you didn't know, lab bills aren't cheap, and while crown and bridge work can be quite lucrative, high quality, aesthetically pleasing ceramics for veneers, crowns, and bridges can be a few hundred dollars per tooth. Some contracts have you paying the entire lab bill. Some say you have to pay 50% and other practices state that they cover it entirely. And no mistake about it, these small percentages in your contract make a big difference over the course of a year's worth of dentistry. Now, I've mentioned in my other videos the beauty of digital dentistry and 3D printing. If you can bring this skill set to your practice, printing your restorations would be able to save you a ton of money on your lab bills. Yes, there's a usual small upfront cost, but it's a small price to pay to learn a career altering skill. Now, next we'll talk about termination clauses. You see, in a perfect world, we would like to think our next job will be the best opportunity for us and there will be no issues and there will never be a better opportunity in the future. However, life doesn't always work like that and sometimes we need to terminate our contracts for another job opportunity. Understanding termination clauses is essential to plan for potential career changes. Review the contract to determine determine the notice period required to terminate the agreement and whether there are any provisions regarding repayment of sign-on bonuses in case of early termination. It is common to have a 30 to 90 day notice requirement if you are to terminate the contract early. This specific clause hurt me when I took a $10,000 sign-on bonus and another $5,000 relocation bonus to start my corporate job. But since I tried to leave within a year, I was told I needed to pay it all back. It's actually these terms that handcuff many associates into their first jobs, preventing them from ever leaving. These corporations that are offering you these contracts definitely know what they're doing, so just be aware. Now, if and when you leave to find a new job, you may be very close to your old practice. Well, if you are the owner of your old practice, you probably wouldn't want your associate to move across the street and take all your existing patients with them. That's why we have non-compete agreements and restrictive covenants built into contracts, ladies and gentlemen. This may very well limit your professional opportunities after your current job and try to negotiate these clauses to ensure that they are reasonable. Some are two miles and some are like 20 miles. If you're living and working in a certain area, you are more than likely to find another opportunity within a small radius of your previous employer. Now, how often do employers enforce these types of agreements? Hmm, I've heard they really aren't enforced ever, but it's something to be aware of when you sign your name on that dotted line. All right, now let's talk bonus incentives. So you're working really hard to earn your collection or production percentage, but what if you go above and beyond your expectations? Well, many dental contracts have incentives built into it to reward your efforts. Production bonuses sound something like, you can make 28 to 35% of production depending on the total amount of money you produce for the month. If you produce 40K, you'll make 28%. But if you can work a little bit harder and produce 70K, you'll get the full 35%. This is a sliding scale incentive. These bonuses can serve as motivation for really hardworking dentists. The bonus incentives I received in my last corporate job were for the overall office, and if we hit the projected monthly budget. If you haven't seen the video, you can click on it right here, but I was able to make over $37,000 a month in my first few months out of school with these bonuses. At times, bonuses can make up the majority of your pay, so pay really close attention to what it says in your contract. Now, I moved from Manhattan in the greatest city in the world, New York City, to Fort Myers, Florida, in the middle of nowhere for my first job. So you bet your butt there was a relocation bonus involved. That isn't the easiest move for somebody like me to make. So check your contract to see if there's one built into it, as it can be used for various moving expenses, like transporting furniture, first month's rent, or even hotel expenses for a few days when you don't have a place to stay. It's also not given in a cash sum, so you can't just go and buy some cool sneakers with the money. They ask for receipts and only certain things are approved. Interestingly enough, the more rural you go, some sign-on bonuses can be upwards of $50,000. Like what? That's really good, but, 
you're most likely locked in for at least two to three years and it's designed to lure you into the corporate model. They know what they're doing. You are most likely in debt and it's real money that you so desperately need right now, right out of school and while you're looking for a job. So for some, it's a really great opportunity. However, if you quit early, you may also be responsible for paying it all back. All right, now let's talk about the differences between being a W-2 and a 1099 employee as a dentist, starting with what those terms mean. When you're a W-2 employee, you're typically seen as part of the dental practices team. You'll get a W-2 form at tax time, which shows that taxes have already been taken out of your paycheck throughout the year. And this setup is pretty common in dental practices, and it means you usually get a paycheck every two weeks. Plus, your employer will often cover things like your licensing fees, DEA registration, and malpractice insurance. You might even get some really nice perks out of it too, like health insurance, dental coverage, and even retirement plan. And when it comes to time off, you'll likely have paid vacations as part of the deal. On the other hand, being a 1099 dentist means you're more of like a freelance worker. Instead of a W-2, you'll get a 1099 form at tax time. That means no taxes were taken out of your pay during the year, so you're responsible for paying them yourself. You'll need to set aside money for taxes and may have to make quarterly payments to the IRS. And since you're not an employee, you won't get the same benefits like health insurance or paid time off. And you'll have to handle things like licensing fees and continuing education costs on your own. So why choose one over the other? Being a W-2 employee offers stability and benefits like health insurance and paid time off. Plus taxes are taking care of you. But if you're a 1099 contractor, you have more independence and control, but it's a little bit more work in the long run. You'll need to handle your own taxes and expenses, but you might prefer that if you want more freedom in how you run your taxes. It really is in the 1099 contractor gig that you are able to write off much more of your expenses against your taxes to potentially save more in the long run. Currently, I write off a lot of food, my car payments, gas mileage, CE courses, some work clothes, among other things too, to get a decent amount back in my tax returns you and your financial situation. Just make sure to understand the implications of each choice and seek professional advice if you're not sure what's best for you. Now, when discussing health benefits, it's essential to weigh the significance of having your employer provide health insurance coverage. In my previous position, I benefited from employer-sponsored health insurance. However, as I explored new opportunities and crunched the numbers on potentially covering my own health expenses, I've realized how quickly the cost can accumulate. Paying out of pocket for medical insurance as well as malpractice coverage, I realized that can amount to several hundred dollars per month. And it's worth noting that health insurance coverage may not automatically be included in every contract. Accidents and unexpected health issues can arise at any time, and having adequate insurance coverage ensures peace of mind and stability. Now, when you're fresh out of dental school and on the hunt for the perfect job, one big thing to consider is the chance to keep learning through mentorship and continuing education courses. I used to get a bunch of messages on Instagram from dental students asking about the CE perks at my corporate job since they saw me placing a lot of implants. Overall, I've had a pretty good experience with getting education through my company. During my time there, I got certified in oral conscious sedation. And I also got to learn a ton of removable prosthodontics through the workshops. Plus we were able to take implant courses at a very discounted rate. Checking your job contract for CE allowance is crucial. It usually ranges between one to $2,000 per year, which can affect your ability to get extra training and improve your skills leading to a lifetime of increased earnings. Make sure you ask about the practice's commitment to ongoing education, like if they help you pay for courses or if they give you time off for conferences. A supportive workplace that encourages learning and mentorship can really help new grads like us. Getting the chance to earn CE credits can boost your skills and open up more opportunities later in your career. So hey, I know this video might not be as flashy as a thrilling implant surgery case or how much money you can make in your first year, but it's honestly one of the most important videos I've ever made. I've seen too many students jump into bad deals with their first job out of school because they didn't understand what they were signing up for. There are people out there looking to take advantage of fresh graduates like you and it's important to be cautious. And if this video has been helpful to you in any way, please show your support by hitting that like button for me. And if I missed anything important, please let's keep the conversation going in the comments below. I'm always here to chat with you personally on Instagram if you need any help with your contracts. Now, after watching this video, I know you're gonna make the best decision for you after all your hard work of becoming a doctor. During negotiations, don't hesitate to ask for what you need. It's normal for both parties to discuss terms and make adjustments. Whether it's a slightly higher salary, a bonus tweak, or changes to a non-compete clause, small adjustments can make a big difference. Just make sure your requests are reasonable. And with that, I'll catch you all in the next one. See ya!